weather warnings were there. I mean, even the day before, there was a flash flood watch, I believe. But when you have a nocturnal event, when you have an extreme event at night, that exacerbates the warning challenge that we, we as colleagues face. <laughs> Welcome back to The Unknowns. Uh, today we have Dr. Marshall Shepard, a renowned meteorologist and climate expert. He's the director of the University of Georgia's Atmospheric Science Program and a former president of the American Meteorological Society. Uh, Dr. Marshall Shepard, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Well, I think everybody's talking about it. It's 2025, and we have a devastating flood in Texas and Kerr County with massive casualties. How did this happen? Like, this well, sounds like something that you'd see in an old newsreel from the 1920s. What is going on? Well, it, unfortunately, it was a tragic, perfect storm of events from a meteorological perspective. I mean, we had this region, first of all, is called Flash Flood Alley for a region, reason. Uh, it experiences a significant Gulf moisture. Uh, the The terrain is complex. So when you get a lot of rainfall falling in that region, uh, it's unfortunately a, a nightmare scenario. And so we had plenty of moisture. There was a, a, a decaying tropical storm, bear, a berry. Uh, there was a, a little mesoscale low, what we call it, sitting over the region. And just all of the conditions that we as meteorologists look for uh, came together, unfortunately. So explain this to me. Give me the metrics on this storm. How much rain? How quickly did it fall? Well, the metric that has caught my eye the most is something that's catching my eye with a lot of rainstorms these days. It's how much rain is falling over a short period of time. So we were looking at rain rates of two to four inches per hour. And for sustained periods of time, uh, part of that perfect storm, tragic perfect storm, was not only did you have ample moisture and rising motion to feed the storm, it wasn't moving very much. So on the early morning hours of July 4th, uh, we got significant rainfall rates falling over a short period of time. And that's a, that's a disaster in itself. And then the storm continued to sit there. It rained for several days afterwards. So uh, you know, that's why we saw, uh, you know, uh, almost two feet of rain ultimately in some parts of that region from the storm. But I'm not as concerned about the amount of total rain that fell as much as I am how much is falling over short bursts of times, which is a hallmark of many storms these days. OK, give me give me a timeline on this. When does it start to rain? So to, to, give, to give you a timeline, uh, the, the warnings were issued by the National Weather Service. There was a flash flood warning issued around 1.14 a.m. on the morning of July 4th. Uh, at around 5.14 or so, they issued a flood emergency because I, so around that, that, that's what made this so tragic also. The weather warnings were there. I mean, even the day before, there was a flash flood watch, I believe. But when you have a nocturnal event, when you have an extreme event at night, that exacerbates the warning challenge that we, we as colleagues face. And so, uh, again, if you go back and look, I wrote something in Forbes recently. I'm a senior contributor to Forbes magazine. I just wrote something today. June 30th, the National Weather Service indicated that that region could have a high impact rain event on, on July 3rd. So four days in advance. So from a weather warning standpoint, there's plenty of information out there. But because this was a nighttime event, because there were some complexities in terms of how that information was getting out to the public and emergency management communities, uh, unfortunately, we saw a, a catastrophic loss of life. I, this might be anecdotal and I might just be making it up, but it feels like being at camp Right. One of the things the kids probably do or people involved are disengage, right, or turn off their phones, you know, do all the things that. W Some camps, they take the phones. So how, how do we deal with that issue? You know, what, what would you, if you had a magic wand, how would you deal with a nocturnal event um, to ensure that people are being informed so at least they have the opportunity to get out of the way? Yeah, we, we deal with that all of the time here in Georgia. I'm in the Atlanta area. I'm, so right now I'm sitting at the University of Georgia in Athens. Uh, we have nocturnal or nighttime tornadoes all of the time. And so one of the things that in, that we, we have several things that we rely on outside siren systems, uh, the wireless emergency alerts on our phones 
and something that I have in my home, a NOAA weather radio. So in terms of the flooding in Texas, you know, there, I think there are real questions that could be asked about why those camps are there in the first place. It's a known flood zone. Uh, and then second, if they are there, uh, they should clearly, in my opinion, have, uh, you know, multiple ways of receiving alerts, not just the phone systems, but maybe have a NOAA weather radio, which is an, uh, will uh, be directly triggered by National Weather Service. And at a very minimum, and perhaps some of the camps do do this, there should be a night plan. There should be a plan for uh, going through evacuation procedures for flooding. I don't know whether they do that or not, but hopefully going forward, uh, we, will, we will see those types of things and perhaps even future warning systems that are similar to the tornado sirens that maybe are anchored to um, measurement systems in the river that will be triggered if there's a certain flow rate in that river. You had mentioned something that these camps, or some of them in your opinion, were in known flood zones. What sure. does that mean? So, you know, there's a recent New York Times piece that really digs into this, but you, know, you can go, any of us watching, any of you watching us or listening to us right now can go and pull up uh, a FEMA flood zone map, uh, the 100 year flood, based on your address. And you can see if you live in a flood zone. Uh, and so, uh, you often hear people talk about the 100-year flood. That's a very bad way of describing it because people think that means this flood happens every 100 years. That actually means there's a 1 in 100 chance of a, a, a flood of that magnitude happening in any given year. This Some aspects of this storm were 100 years. Some may have been 500 to 1,000 years in terms of 1 in 1,000 chance. But from what I've read recently, and again, I'm not the expert on the hydrology, but from what I can see, uh, clearly uh, these 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 um, facilities and these RV parks may have been in some pretty treacherous flood prone territory. And again, I emphasize this: this is Flash Flood Alley. This region has experienced those types of floods in the past, and they will again. So, with that knowledge, how does the government, right, in Texas or the federal government, if they have these identified areas, how, if if you had your way or your vision or unlimited budget, how would you protect those areas more? So, you know, I you know, I come at this mostly as a scientist, so I, I, I can't claim to be able to make policy. But here are some things that I would recommend if policymakers brought me in as an expert. Uh, one, to make sure that if these regions are in sort of designated flood zones, one of the things that we know is that climate is likely juicing rainstorms. We get them naturally, but because the atmosphere is warmer, there's more water vapor available to rainstorms. So that's why they're rainy with more intensity. It's basic. It's just basic physics. It's not my opinion. Secondly, uh, are there sort of real-time warning systems? That, in Europe, for example, they have a system that where they have stream gauges in the water and those stream gauges will trigger alarms if there are certain flow rates. Do we need those? I, I know those types of systems are, have been looked at. I know that there's extensive cost involved. And so again, uh, those are decisions at the local level that I can't inject. I'm just you know giving my perspective on things that can help. But I do believe that if you are anywhere, even if you're not in a flood zone, but especially if you are in one, uh, you should have NOAA weather radio access. You should have wireless wireless emergency alerts always enabled on your cell phones. And there needs to be a comprehensive plan and review process in facilities that might be in these regions. So in your opinion, other than this was a nocturnal event, there were adequate timely notice in this particular area. Whether it was received or not is another question. But I, I think, Yes, that's right. I, I think that the weather warnings got you down the field 90 yards or so, but we didn't get quite get over the finish line or the goal line in terms of getting the messaging out. And so I think people will look at what, what happened there, what was going on. Um, but yes, I do. There were indications days in advance that there was going to be a high impact event. Uh, there were weather watches, flood watches and warnings in the hours in advance as well. Uh, uh, but again, uh, there, I think only time we don't have a national transportation safety board. Um, like if this were an, an aircraft uh, crash, there is an entity that would go back and sort of do a forensic look at all of this. Uh, many of us now believe we need that exact type of functionality uh, with weather and other kinds of natural disasters. So we can very much deal with these types of questions, Charlie, that you're asking so that we can, you know, 
make improvements for the future. I'm a parent. It breaks my heart to see what happened there with so many kids involved. Uh, I think there are real questions about, I mean, what do, as a parent, what do I need to do if I send my kid off to a future camp? Right. Uh, is it in a flood zone? What can I learn to ensure their safety on, on my own, even if assuming that the other uh, things are being taken care of? Among your circle of colleagues, your compares, obviously you mentioned this was the flash flood alley. People knew about it in your industry. Are there other particular areas that are as dangerous that you keep keep you up at night sometimes going, oof, I hope that doesn't happen there? Why, well, you know, I think any type of place with complex terrain and where you have a significant urban or populated uh, region downstream of a river, I mean, one of, I, I think the, most deadly non-hurricane related flood on record happened in Colorado uh, several decades ago. And it was a very similar scenario where you had a lot of water sort of rushing down a, a, a river. Uh, and so those types of scenarios always keep me up at night. I mean, increasingly hurricanes are also, we saw with Hurricane Helene, for example, uh, we saw in Durham, North Carolina, just this past week with the remnants of tropical storm Chantal, Again, a common theme, Charlie, is that, yes, weather and rainfall systems happen naturally, but they're, they're, on average, there's greater intensity in those rain rates. They're falling with much more intensity. And so in urban environments, in places where you have mountains like Helene, part of the challenge there is you had this inland storm, but you also had the additional uplift from the mountains, the Appalachia as well. So those are regions that always worry me as well. But just any type of urban environment, because again, as water hits the landscape, it tends to either infiltrate into the soil or gently run off. But in urbanized regions, it runs off much faster and it doesn't infiltrate. So that's why many of these hurricanes are producing such significant floods as well. You mentioned something very interesting about how if there's a plane crash, there's the NTSB that goes in, looks at the science, looks at the data, comes up with the conclusions and recommendations moving forward. It seems like, you know, that should just exist. Is 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 that something that, that you've been advocating or other colleagues have been advocating? Yeah, we've had people in the field. That, I'm the former president of the American Meteorological Society, which is the largest professional society in this field. And over the years, starting back with colleagues like Dr. Will, Bill Hook or even a private sector meteorologist like Mike Smith, who used to spend time work with a private company called AccuWeather and, and now has his own private ventures. Uh, there, there, I even heard the recent uh, nominee uh, and his uh, Neil Jacob, he's the current uh, NOAA administrator nominee. Uh, he was having his confirmation hearing just yesterday. And I, I think he even noted the possibility of having something like that. It's a no brainer because we know these things will happen again. But what are the things that we can do, just like with an airplane uh, crash, that we can learn to ensure a greater degree of safety going forward with the next event? What are the other known no-brainers do you think about, right? Like more balloons, more this, more that. Like how, what, if you could arm our nation with a more complete weather protection system, what are we missing? What do we need to address? Well, I think the weather, again, the weather forecasts were sound with this particular forecast. With again, You know, getting the exact pinpoint location of the exact bullseye of heavy rain, that's just, we're never going to be a, be able to give you a pinpoint we have to do it in a probabilistic aerial sense. My point is, I think the weather aspect of this warning was fine. Uh, obviously, we would always, we want to make sure we have fully staffed weather service offices. We want to make sure we're launching the weather balloons twice a day at least, and perhaps even more, have uh, functioning radars, uh, satellite systems, and and the most advanced models. We are moving more into AI-based weather models as, as opposed to the more dynamic types of models that we use. But I think in this case, I think the questions uh, really are at the intersection of the hydrological warning response and also the emergency response. When you sort of look at uh, weather, you know, for the last, well, as long as we've been keeping records, what are you seeing that are anomalies? What are you seeing both in your lifetime? You're like, I don't remember that. But just in general, since we've been keeping records. So we know that climate is changing, Charlie. I mean, that, you know, I, I, 
we, we just do. The science is clear on that. I co-authored a report for the National Academies a few years ago on something called attribution. That is, can we attribute today's extreme weather events in any way to climate change? And what we found is that there are signals of climate change in today's weather. We don't have to talk about 2050 or 2100. Uh, and so one of the most sort of clear climate change signals in today's weather is the increased rain rates, the intensity. Uh, in every sector of the United States, the science is showing the top 1% to 2% rain intensity events are much heavier than they were in 1950 or 1960. Here's the other problem with that. When we designed stormwater management systems for cities in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we assumed that the rainstorms of 1960 and 1970 would be like the rainstorms of 2025, and they're not. So the stormwater management design is assumed stationarity. That's what that's called. So that's a big challenge. So we know the rain intensities have increased. We know the frequency intensity of heat waves and droughts have increased. And even some aspect, you look at hurricanes, like we're in the midst of hurricane season. Over the last several years, we've seen a lot of these hurricanes rapidly intensify. Let me speak to one other hidden aspect that is relevant to this storm. The Gulf waters are extremely warm. How does that relate to the Texas flooding? When waters are warmer, there's more evaporation coming off that water. And so that's more water available to fuel these rainstorms. And so that's a hidden aspect of the climate warming that, that we have to look at with storms like this. The fact that a warmer atmosphere has more water vapor available to it, and these anomalously warm sea surface temperatures also increase evaporative rates, which brings more water vapor out of the I mean, brings more water out of the ocean or the Gulf into the air as water vapor, which is, again, the fuel supply in some ways for these storms. Very basic question, and, and excuse my ignorance, but is are there periods of written records of weather that we go through these periods, or is this a true anomaly in your opinion? I think that, you know, as I, as I often talk about, uh, I use this analogy, grass grows naturally in our yard. But when we fertilize it, it grows differently. So we have a naturally varying cycle where we certainly have had dry and wet periods and we can see those types of things. We certainly have a natural cycle of weather, including rainstorms, hurricanes, and so forth. But these storms are now amplified with a human steroid. Baseball players could hit home runs naturally, but in the steroid era, they were hitting more of them and longer ones. And so that's the analogy that best suits. One thing I want to sort of also emphasize, because we have been dealing with this, this was not caused by cloud seeding. There was, there was a lot of discussion out there about cloud seeding, and yes, maybe there was some going on. I wrote something on this in Forbes recently. Uh, cloud seeding, one, has been shown to be inconclusive in most of the scientific literature. And even at best, if it does work, it probably adds about 10% to the seasonal average. But more importantly, um, the cloud seeding, if you, you think about it this way, if cloud seeding is lighting a match, uh, if you light a match and there's a raging inferno in the forest, that match is not going to do anything because that raging forest was already there and had plenty of fuel. This storm had plenty of moisture and plenty of the meteorological factors that we look for. Cloud seeding is a tiny, insignificant player in this event. Well, thank you, Doctor, for joining us. I have one last question. This show is called The Unknowns. I'd love you to share something that you've never told anybody, maybe your wife, that's unknown about you. <laughs> You know, you know, I have a pretty public profile, so if people are aware of me, they can find out a lot about me. But one of the things that people, there are two unknowns. One, when I was a freshman in college at Florida State University, I won a Chevy, brand new Chevy Silverado chair. So those things do happen. And the second thing is, if you were, were to force me to eat mayonnaise or mustard bag full of, with a million dollars in it, I'd be broke. How much I hate mayonnaise and mustard. Well, now I think some of your students are probably going to bring you some mayonnaise and mustard on, <laughs> after this airs. Well, Absolutely. thank you so much for your time, your expertise, and uh, I hope you join us again. Absolutely, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you.